Please, can I get everyone's attention? It's time for session two. It's time to get real. So our first presenter in this part of the conference is Dr. Annie Good, who's going, who is a cognitive scientist from Gorilla in the Room. And he's going to be talking about how XR can be applied to consumer research today and the implications of it becoming a new media channel and how it can inf inform consumer behavior. So can Dr. Ali Good please come to the stage? Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, so I am a cognitive scientist. That means um, I'm a psychology, basically. Um, so yeah, I'm really going to talk about something a little bit different to these sessions this morning, very good sessions this morning about the metaverse. Um, and you know, as I developed the talk, it sort of uh, turned away from kind of getting excited about something to sort of actually let's get real. Um, so as I say, I'm a cognitive scientist. My passion has been um, the fact that people don't always tell you, uh, you know, if you ask people a question, they'll, they'll give you an answer, but that answer doesn't always reflect their behavior. And I've been working over the last 20 years in research and 10 years before that as an academic to sort of work on trying to solve that. Um, so 20 years ago, I was doing reaction time, no second reaction time stuff and uh, implicit testing. I think I was the first person to do that. Um, and then I discovered the world of XR and it was like, hold on a second. This is, like, you know, this is great, we can do some stuff with this. So um, when you talk about the metaverse, as um, Carl Nick talked earlier, it's this beautiful place with beautiful people, with beautiful headsets, looking at beautiful things, being beautiful. And there's lots of great stuff there. And I think it's, I think that I echo what the guy said earlier. I think it's going to be a very exciting and very interesting place. Um, but here's my but. Um, and the thing is, I'm going to separate the metaverse from the metaverse technology. So we know about, um, you know, we talked about Web3, um, Carl talked about Web3 and augmented reality. And he, he gave the definitions for me, which is really handy. Thank you, Carl. Um, so it's talking about that technology. And really the question is, you know, we're a research um, sector. What is it that we can do with this stuff? is really what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so when I start, to, you start talking to people about um, research and the metaverse, they often kind of start defaulting to, hey, you know, headsets. Wow, great. We can put headsets on and we can, we can do what we do now. We can, we, can run, so we can run focus groups. We can run interviews. It's going to be great. And uh, that top picture is a picture of me running a focus group in a virtual setting with very blocky avatars. Um, yeah, it's actually really fascinating because this was, this was just head and hand tracking. So you only saw somebody moving these kind of three blobs, but it was almost like um, it, how, how can you sort of dice, uh, titrate the human condition down to three movements so you still get a sense of humanity, as, you, as I really did when I was talking to these people. I think one was in Kentucky, one was in Toronto, one was in Saudi Arabia at the time. So, you know, shows the possibilities and I think with you know kind of Meta's new pro you've got the face tracking so you can do that even more you can see the facial facial you know facial reactions you can it we will it will literally be like talking to people face to face which is amazing so that's a possibility but this is all in the future and I think a lot of what Khan and Nick said it's a lot of speculation is going on at the moment but I kind of really care about what we can do now with this technology. How can we take this technology and start to use it to the benefit of our clients and solve some of the problems that they've always had? Um, so as I say, I'm a psychologist, so I have various views on things, so I thought I'd share them today. Um, and applying XR to consumer research, um, I think there are some important considerations. Number one, what technology is out there that we can use? Um, there's a lot of tech out there. How can we apply it? Um, the second is the psychology associated with XR. I think that's important. Of course, I'm a psychologist. But I think that's important because um, it indicates and gives us a good steer on where we can possibly start using this technology most advantageously. Um, I'm going to be a little uh, go off a little tangential about how does XR fit into people's lives. I think there was a question um, earlier about you know how does um, XR you know how does the metaverse solve a problem I have now. I think that's an interesting question. And my latest kind of passion is the kind of what date, new data we can capture and how we can use that data for the benefit of clients. So what technology is, avail technology is available? Okay, so we've talked a lot about Metaverse. Metaverse is kind of usually accessed through kind of headsets and there's 70 million of them out in the world. There's 6.64 billion 
smartphones. Maybe between one and two billion that support something like AR or VR. So, which is what's going to be, what are people going to use now? Uh, and also working in a tech hub, I know that people get these headsets. They tend to be gamers. They tend to be young people. They tend to use them for a bit. They tend to play uh, Beat Saber. If you want to play Beat Saber, it's fantastic. I recommend it. And then they go back to the PS4. And to prove this point, um, or to try to emphasize this point, Snap gets 200 million augmented reality impressions every day. That's nearly three times more than the number of headsets in the world. And that's just people playing about giving themselves bunny ears and bunny teeth and whatever as the kind of lenses. But, you know, it's still an AR interaction. That's what people are using. So that's the kind of first clue where we can start using this technology now. Um, the second is the psychology associated with XR. I think, as Carl and Nick said earlier, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things. And I think Carl's work is amazing. He's got some amazing stuff. It's really brilliant. But one of our clients, um, a lot of our, the big companies are setting up XR departments. One of our clients went to the XR uh, conference recently in San Diego. Nearly all um, uh, um, enterprise and mostly in education. There wasn't really that much else actually going on now because and I think one of the problems is there's a human being in there. What is that human being's experience? I think there's a lot of tech happening that's doing some amazing stuff, but there's a human brain at the end of it absorbing and being into, uh, affected by it. And I think that's what we need to consider. And the, one of the key things that XR does, or VR and AR do, is create a sense of presence, or telepresence, if you want to call it that. Basically, that means it makes you feel like the second reality that is that you see is the one that you're in. You may feel like it's the one, you know, we all have sort of dual realities, like if you're reading a book or looking at the TV, so there's the reality of seeing the media and the reality of like, you know, there's two dual reality here. There's reality of you sitting people with around, around next to people sort of, you know, writing and hopefully listening. And there's me telling you a story. Um, we all live in these two realities. It's just with VR and XR, um, the second reality is by far more compelling than anything else. Um, one of the first, you know, this is usually a place illusion, you know, does the thing look real? Plausibility illusion, you know, is, every, is everything reacting in the way it should do? With VR, you've got the body ownership illusion where your body takes on the kind of the, um, um, the sense of the sense of the avatar takes in, in what the, you feel embodiment with that. And interoception, which is an idea I put up there because it's my old mate, Anil Seth, who's a professor at Sussex, and uh, he's, he's, he's come up with that. It's, it's basically if you're in an emotional state and then your body has that response to that emotional state and that's what's happening that you feel like you're present anyway um a lot of this was talked by uh, about in terms of vr one of the first things i did was look at it with augmented reality it's a piece of blue sky research with ipsos and we found that augmented reality you know literally just doing the kind of thing that you would do in a online survey we had a picture of a tin of beans and we used an augmented reality um creation of a tin of beans and then I, did, I adapted the Slater also Steed questionnaire for presence and showed that more or less you can get up to four times the amount of presence for a product in using augmented reality. Um, and that's probably conservative because it was done very much in isolation and very much out of context. So why is that important? Why is this idea of presence important? Well, I try and explain it to people saying that we can do research in three places. And when we, do, we, when we do research, we're always doing research in one of three places. We're doing research in the past. We ask people, what's happened to you previously? And they tell us. And I, say, I did my PhD in consciousness and memory and stuff. And they report back. And some of that stuff is, can be accurate. But, you know, it's more a, re, more a sort of a summary, a representation of what it is, a kind of a schematic representation rather than actual sort of a recording of the real event. So it can be accurate, but it can be um, slightly off sometimes, or we can do research in the future. We can show people something, give them a concept, give them an idea, and tell them to, ask them to take a mental leap into some point in the future where this thing exists, and then imagine how they're going to react to it. And we're crap at that. The brain is not very good at doing that at all. It's really bad. We're just designed not to be able to do that. And that's one of the key jobs as researchers that we have to do for companies. For businesses need to come up with new things, come up with new ideas and get them tested. So we're forever trying to get people to take this kind of journey into the future. 
to understand something, and we're just not very good at doing it. And that's because behavioral economics fans um, uh, will know that basically the brain is designed to work in the now. The brain, all this, this, all this system two, system one. System one is effectively a whole bunch of processes that absorb information that come in from all different sources. It kind of churns through it really quickly and then chucks out an intuitive sensation on how we should, what we should be doing next. In effect, the brain is just one great big what happens next predictor. As we were evolving, it's like, you know, if I grab that branch, is it going to break? If I tread on that, you know, is it going to go schlup? Is it, if I see that animal, is it going to chase me? Am I going to chase it? It's just this what happens next. And that's the whole point about trying to, of the system one, is just be this next predictor. So you can see where I'm going with this, is that XR is a perfect way to just try and take, get people, rather than trying to imagine what the future's like, to get people into the present. Because quite frankly, Sorry about the quality of the next video, but no matter how much you try and simulate something and how much you try and make something sort of feel like it's real, reality will always win. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows what happened to the rabbit. <laughs> so I personally believe that extended reality is the uh, research tool that uh, behavioral economics has been crying out for. I think we can think a lot about sort of, you know, I mean, there's a whole history of doing implicit testing, but I think the ability to, to stop people going into the future and create a futuristic thing for them now is really important and actually one of the key superpowers of extended reality for the research sector. Um, as a slight tangent, um, how does XR fit into people's lives? It's a question here earlier saying, you know, what does the metaverse do for me now? And what's in it for people? That's the big question we have to think about if we're going to start applying this technology, particularly for businesses, what's in it for them? Um, to tell a story, I mean, uh, uh, Carl talked earlier about the fashion. I think we did discuss this, you know, about potential use. And actually one of my respondents a little while ago was, I was talking about digital fashion to them and saying, you know, you can go into the metaverse and you can put on a nice, you know, have an avatar, put on a nice, you know, design a thing. And she was like, meh, I know, so what? And then literally the conversation, in, you know, listen to her, talk herself into it by going, hold on a second. But, so there's this place. It was actually kind of a decentralized type place. So it was Web3. And she said, but I can go into this place and I can create an avatar that looks like me. And then I can dress myself in these clothes before I buy them so I can see how well I look, how good I look. Oh God, that's, a, that's great. So I don't, I don't have to buy this stuff, I can just try it on and then I can buy it in the real world. Oh, brilliant. And it's like, you know, she had no concept, no interest at all in like the reality of now of what's going on in the metaverse. But as soon as I said, it'll make you look good in the real world, she was interested. So I think it's trying to find those kind of hooks that people will engage with that is going to be the real success of where this technology and where the metaverse will go. And also the final consideration is ultimately as a research sector, we serve brands who need to do stuff. So what can we do with this technology? And this is what we know. We've come up with various solutions. It's not the total totality of the solutions, but I'll show you some in a minute. But, you know, what's in it for the brands that we work with? Why should they care about this technology? And more or less, if you ask brands, they want one of two things. Is it faster? Is it cheaper? That's the key. Um, and, you know, slight humble brag, we're working with a client at the moment who's taken some of our tech, not what I'm talking about today, and they're thinking about scaling it because it works out as 10 times faster and 24 times cheaper. At the end of the day, the people with the budgets, the financial directors, they'll listen to that. They won't listen to, oh, it's a great experience. Oh, people feel lovely. Oh, look at the technology, it's great. That's all speculation. Oh, you're going to save me money and make me more agile? Oh, yeah, I'll have that, please. I think that's the kind of thing we also have to think about as a research sector in applying it. And as I say, when we start applying this stuff, this is, you know, this is our solution. It's not the totality of the solution. It's just something that is sort of some examples that we've done. So making augmented reality packs and products is something that we do. And we apply that. 
Um, a few little tips. It's kind of, you know, the key to it is making it look real, making it look realistic, you know, getting the lighting right, getting the rendering right, um, getting the things happening in the right order. Um, it's actually quite, you know, the democratization of the technology to do this is remarkable now. You know, this was mind blowing kind of five years ago. And now it's kind of like, you know, you can, there's a lot of people out there who can do this stuff. And I think that's one of the great things about this new tech is there's a lot of stuff out there that we can use to really help people. Um, what we do is we put it into... Oh, hello, that's very interesting. It's supposed to be a little block in there, never mind. Um, we, uh, we put it into uh, mobile surveys. So you can have the mobile survey as it is. You can link to an AR experience and then you can come out and have the mobile survey at the end. So again, it's linking into the kind of systems that we have at the moment. Um, so it's very straightforward to do that. Um, and you may have noticed I had three points. I was missing the fourth point. The fourth point comes now is what kind of data can we capture? What new kinds of data? And one of the things I've sort of started getting very passionate about is the ability to sort of capture how people interact with, this, with these experiences. And you can use, it was slightly off there, but you get the idea. You can use, as I noticed, people were looking at these kind of augmented reality things. You can see them going, oh, look, look at that. Oh, wow. And, look around that. and you can start to capture those data. And we've done a lot of work in sort of the algorithms to interpret what all that means. So again, that's a new kind of data source that we can find. So I, I sadly couldn't get a live uh, example of this, but say, for example, something that we do with PAC research, um, with this kind of data, you can say, okay, well, what can, you know, what people, what are going to people look at? What people, what are people looking at? Um, you know, big question: Do they read the back of the pack? Well, it's a three-dimensional object; they can do everything they want with it. We can look. That's always a big question in pack research. Do they understand how the pack works? If it's going to have a new opening mechanism, is that going to help people? Is that going to help people? Is that going to disrupt the the experience? Um, you know, and we get a lot of stuff in about recyclable. You know, obviously people want to change to recyclable pack packaging and they're changing the formats and kind of the way it feels. Um, and the attention economy is a big thing at the moment. I'm embroiled in another debate in another bit of the world about that. But, you know, you can record um, all these data and you can use it to create heat maps. You know, are people finding things easily? Um, you know, where's the hierarchy of information? Literally, if you use an AR object, it's like people have a pack in their hand and they're sort of playing with it and looking around it and saying, okay, what can I do? You know, is, where's the information that I need? Um, you know, what elements contribute to pack communication? You know, how does the, which, which functions work best? Are people getting it? Are they kind of opening and closing it correctly? That kind of stuff. So that's one thing you can do with augmented reality. Um, with virtual reality, uh, you can do the same thing. Again, mobile-based. Um, you can do this one of two ways. You can do it using an AR magic window where literally you can hold your thing up and you can look around a sort of in, basically inside of a sphere and you can see what's going on. Or you can use Google Cardboard, which literally is a little box like that that people put a mobile phone in and then it's got lenses in and you can use it and turns your mobile phone into a VR viewer. Um, and again, you can record all the data so you can record the information. Um, and this is kind of one of the digital assets that we get. Again, tips on making good things look real in that, like this, you know. Hopefully you can see there's dirt on the floor. Um, there's a car park outside. Everything's messy. It's the real world, you know. It's not, I know a lot of the kind of simulations of uh, supermarkets have kind of, you know, pictures rather than... But you've got three-dimensional, you've got depth. And it's, you know, you suddenly put this on and you're going, I'm in a supermarket, bloody hell. And again, you can, you can record where people are looking. But, you know, you can take people on a journey. And, I mean, the key tip I'd say is if you're going to create something, just make it messy. Just make it look like, you know, a thousand consumers have been there before. Because um, that's the real world of how you interact. Um, so, real case history. Um, we did this with Mondelez uh, a couple of years ago. Um, they wanted to check whether there were th um, three different kinds of planograms that were going to work for them. Um, they sort of asked if we could, you know, we created them and then we put them through, I think it was with Google Cardboard, asked people to sort of uh, just track, and we tracked where their, their kind of head direction was and from that we were able to work out sort of broadly where they were sort of paying attention to-ish, that's a, that's a broad term. We could mark different areas like uh, in areas of interest and then create a heat map of where people were paying attention to. And the outcome was that one of the uh, configurations worked a lot better than the other two. Um, it was implemented mainly because we could work out people were scanning a lot on the other two and not on one, the first one. 
um, it was implemented and they saw an uplift in return on investment, which was, uh, you know, nice to have. Um, also wanted to talk a little bit about XR as a media channel. Um, presented this MRS conference last year. Um, it was a project with uh, Yahoo and our research partners on that, which are on device. Um, Pringles had their Frank Zombie campaign and they had this kind of hand coming out of a Pringles can pointing and doing stuff. Um, I mean, just to say with uh, increases in exposure to XR, I mean, it's just brand shifts go off the scale with, with augmented reality, that it does a lot of good stuff. There's people who just come across this thing and do it. And this is not, these, this is on devices data, not our own. Um, and uh, you know, it's just lots of good things happen with augmented reality. But the interesting thing was when we started to track the device movement and how people were interacting with it, um, we've been able to interpret kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's millions of data points. So we've got the kind of uh, uh, algorithms that interpret this and we've come up with measures of interest, engagement and exploration. Interest, how motivated are people going to stick with it? Engagement, how involved with the experience they are? And exploration, literally how much of it do they look at? Um, the great thing was, in this case, when you looked at interest and exploration, when interest and exploration were high, you got bigger shifts in uh, brand attitude. So again, I'm not going to start claiming that behavioral data capture is going to pr predict uh, attitude, but it did go in that direction in this case. And I think it's worth mentioning as well, I think we had a comment earlier about you know uh, using the metaverse, I mean, particularly when um, you're looking at something like virtual reality as a as a, as a media channel. Um, I put this slide in simply because I think it's fascinating that it's going to be a completely different way of a kind of brand communication. I mean, totally, totally different. This idea that you should come up with a brand truth, tell a person that about a brand truth, and they learn about it and then go off and act on it just doesn't work. More or less, you have kind of two kinds of memory. You've got semantic memory and episodic memory. Um, semantic memory is knowing stuff. Episodic memory is remembering an episode of, uh, that, uh, of something that happened in your life. And that's what you get when you have a virtual experience. So it's a completely different way. You're going to have to think, rethink planning and rethink executions. I think it's going to be a great challenge for the research industry and for the creative industry. Um, so... I think we have to take the current technology seriously. Yahoo did a, a piece of research at the end of 2020. 64% of adults are excited about it, 77% of 18 to 24s, but most importantly, 63% of, of the young ones expected XR to be part of their retail experience. And that's almost exclusively augmented reality. So it's happening. So, you know, whereas I think the metaverse is brilliant and I think it's going to have great future and there's a lot of spec you know a lot of speculation going into it now it's fantastic but you know we have to accept the reality that meta has just lost 9.4 billion pounds on it and they laid off 1100 people 11000 people across the business but what we can do now is you know the future's going to be amazing it's going to be fascinating but there's technology that we can use now and that's what we've been trying to do and if you understand the psychological impact of how that technology works, I think you're going to get some, you know, kind of good answers. Um, I think there will be new measures. We've got some. There are probably going to be more that we're going to find as we go along. And don't wait for the metaverse. There's some bloody cool tech you can use now. And you can do it. And, it's, and there's not only a good kind of intellectual reason, there's a good commercial reason for using it as well. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's tons of questions. And if there's not any in the room, those watching the live stream, you can put your questions in the chat and uh, it'll be read out in the room. One at the front here, and I think it's one at the back of here. Hi, uh, great talk, thanks very much. Um, taking this organisation back to its roots, which in the dark days used to be all about data, when you're, uh, you're looking at these interactions in augmented realities you were showing on the mobile phones, um, isn't there a challenge with the sheer volume of data and, and, and how you analyse it and the techniques you use? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is the simple answer, yeah. It, it's, it's taken a lot of development to be able to capture the data in a way that is both feasible and interpretable. Thankfully, the onset of, I mean, the onset of kind of fast broadband 5G has been a great help. So, yes, there is, there's a, there's a ton of data in there. 
I had a question over here. Hi, um, thanks very much for this, very interesting. I work a lot with emerging technology interpreting and implementing it for market research. And the um, most frequent pushback I get from both um, stakeholders and clients when talking about things like AI and VR is comparison to video. Do you yeah. have anything to kind of say around that, any kind of research you've done? Um, with that comparison to to be able to argue for so that they they are suggesting that using video to show stems yeah is is the same okay well the answer there is that it's it's uh, now if I get my art theory right there's that the active spectator theory which is the way you describe it which is that if you're into, involved in something if you're at, because when you use augmented reality the person who's viewing is an active is active agent in the actual viewing experience whereas video is passive you can sit back and not do anything you have to be actively moving a device around doing something interacting with it which means it's a much more a, it's a much more realistic experience it's a much more relevant experience and also i'd go back to um, the point about presence. Augmented reality creates a sense of presence. There, I, I, have, I didn't show it today, but I got a video of um, one of our respondents looking at a Coke can and then going, oh yeah, and then going, where did it go? Because people get confused and people can believe that the thing in front of them through this little window does exist. And that's the key benefit is they say the first thing I did was work out that augmented reality creates presence. And that's vital in being able to make things that don't exist, exist now. So that's the difference. The key difference is stuff exists in the now. And if you want me to talk to your clients, I'll explain that to them in great depth. We have a question at the back here. My question is actually really similar, but on the other side of the scale. In Have you done any research on the research around how this could introduce bias? And so how alike to a real-world situation, is it? And how can we interpret that and evaluate that as researchers? When you, when you say bias, what how do you mean? So, because it is an AR experience, what is the bias that is introduced? So what what is the factor that I am taking into account of it being AR rather than a real-life experience? Is it... Oh, so AR is not as good as real life. Yeah. Real life is the most most compelling thing. But if you, as I say, if you're going to create, if you want to try and create something that's real, that can be very expensive. Yeah. Whereas if you create something in augmented reality, the cost of it decreases dramatically. And I think that's the difference. I mean, you know, I, I mean, we've never done it with the automotive sector, but I know they spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on bloody great big models. Of, of you know of cars and they would look at the designs. Yeah, do it in VR. It, 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 it. Sorry, have you ever done tests comparing real life and AR? So doing a control to see how the results vary. Yes, we have, and I think it was with. Hold on a second. It was with. It was with augmented reality, and you know, as expected. Um, <laughs> In fact, one with augmented reality, one with virtual reality. The augmented reality, again, not as good as real life, but better than showing a picture, which is what we'd expect, somewhere in between. Um, with virtual reality, actually worked with a Royal Shakespeare company on that one and um, showed that, you know, that I think it was top of mind, I think it was something like there was 80% of people felt a sense of presence compared to watching a video, which was around about sort of 30 40%. So, you know, we, we, we took a 360 camera into the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, recorded Titus Andronicus, dreadful play, and got people to watch it. And then um, those who watched, some people watched it in VR, some people watched it in the theatre. And I think it was something like, I think it was almost 93% of people said they felt like they were in the theatre at some point. I know, and as anecdotally, there were kind of people who, the biggest complaint was, People couldn't, you know, they looked down to try and find the program and suddenly realized they had a headset on. And there was one guy who sort of kicked his shoes off and suddenly went, oh my God, and because he couldn't see his feet. You know, it, it just tricks the brain into thinking that you're there. We have one uh, final question from sure. the live stream. Yeah, so this question is from Elena, who's watching remotely. She says, thank you for a great presentation. Can you please share more details on how exactly you operationalized slash measured interest such that it is distinct from exploration. 
I hope you understand that question. I do. Can't ask a lady. Thank you very much for the question, and I will uh, take take the Fifth Amendment on that one because that's intellectual property. But essentially, it is looking at the data set that we collect, and there are various things that you can measure, and it's looking at different combinations of those metrics, and we've uh, scaled that against lots of different other metrics. So we've, we've compared it and done all the hard testing on it. So sorry, I, I can't tell you, but we are VC backed, and if I started giving out our intellectual property, I, I would actually get shot. Is that by or got a question? Can I ask a question? Of course you can. <laughs> that wasn't my question. Um, I'm sitting here speculating. So as we become more used to using augmented reality, um, being more involved in the metaverse, I mean, I've just sat here and I was taken aback with the fact that I, my, my children use Snapchat, I use Snapchat with them, and I'm actually using, I'm in that space of the metaverse. But where we're using all of this for marketing purposes or whatever purposes, like, you know, going to IKEA, buying products for our house. Do you think there will be an impact on society in the long run? So at the moment, conditions like dementia are on the rise, whatever the reasons for that may be. But do you think this could lead to a sense of confusion? That you do hear in, um, in the news sometimes, you know, a child's gone out and killed his mum with a knife because he thought he was in a game. Just putting that out there. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't think so with augmented reality. I think there's a positive side to it as well. I used to work with people with closed head injury and with dementia um, clients back in my academic days. Um, so there is some, I actually do know, and I haven't got around to doing it yet, but I do know how to make an augmented reality app that will predict the dementia. That's another story. Um, in terms of virtual reality, I think it's something different. I don't think it is necessarily true in this country, but certainly I can imagine that um, if you were in a shoot 'em up game and there was a trigger and something happened, you do tend to respond intuitively. And I think that could, I, I could imagine if there were, there was lots of VR shoot 'em up gaming in America that the shooting rate would go up because people would be more ready to pull the trigger. I can imagine that happening as a specific. Um, but that, you know, that does happen. I mean, it happened uh, a couple of years ago. There was a case where the policeman was very severely injured because they were role playing with blanks and he just, somebody pulled a gun and he went blank automatically. So I think we do it anyway. And I can see that happening in certain circumstances with augmented reality. I find that a little bit hard because essentially it's, if you've got an, a, a thing that's there, it's, you know, I can't see, I can't really see it. It's hard to say. Maybe that's more of a question when virtual reality glasses come out. I mean, I'm with Carl. I think the game changer is going to be when the Apple glasses come out. But we've been waiting for them for about three years now. So when they arrive, it'll be great. But that will be a different thing. So, yeah. But again, there's always, for each one of those kind of applications, there's always going to be a positive application. So you could imagine somebody with dementia having a, with a head, with, a, with glasses on, with cues telling them what to do next, because they have pattern pro problems with their patterns of what they do. They can't, they get stuck in patterns of like sort of, you know, make, like making a cup of tea. They keep doing the same thing over and over again. Whereas you could have a, a thing that would say, make a cup of tea, okay, now get the tea bag, now get the water, now get the whatever. And I think that's where it could be good as well. So, you know, yes, there are problems, but there are equally a number of good things too. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, that's definitely got my mind going and my question bubbles all over the place. So I might catch you at lunch for a few more questions if you don't mind.